Welcome to the Seattle Investors Club podcast with Julie Clark and Joe Bauer, where we share the nuts and bolts of real estate investing from our 20 plus years in the industry. Sit back, relax, listen, and immediately take action. Are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing podcast. My name is Joe Bauer. I'm here with my co-host, Julie Clark. Julie, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Joe. It's a good Tuesday here in the Seattle area. Feeling a little cooped up from the last week just because, honestly, I'm so busy. I mean, real estate market here is still chugging along. Um, I'm actually extremely busy and haven't been able to get out of my office the last few days. So, um, you know, my kids are screaming and yelling at me because I've promised to go on a big bike ride with them the past two days and found myself sitting in my office every day till six o'clock. So the good and the bad, you know, to be honest with you, I was enjoying being a little slower, but I feel like, like now I'm kind of back up to speed, sort of the new normal. Everything is, is just chugging along, you know? So, um, what are you guys up to? Where are you guys at? Uh, we're over in Chelan right now and looking out over the beautiful lake. So we've been hanging out here. Really haven't been doing too much, you know, outside other than just running on the roads and things like that. But it sounds like the trails might open back up here in a few weeks, which would be really cool. Yeah. We almost actually went on a drive. We were going to do um, just a long drive this weekend. And we were thinking of just driving over to Chelan and back going over for the day. What's yeah. that Hollywood beach or something like that? You know where that is? There's a few beaches. Um, yeah. There's the one down in town. I think that one might, might still be closed though. It, that's why we didn't go. Cause we thought it was going to be closed. So uh, we didn't make it out on a big road trip this weekend, but uh, definitely heading up highway to this coming weekend. Um, nice. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, guess what, guys? We are excited today. We're going to jump into it. Um, we are going to jump onto it. First of all, wait a minute, Joe. I got I to gotta ask you something. What's As up? I've noticed. Um, first of all, are you guys on video today? Are you and, you and our guest on video? Yes, we are. Well, I think it'd be important to give everybody a look at your hairdo because this is the only time. <laughs> Let's see it, brother. We can this do is it. A good, this so, is my entertainment is seeing Joe's <laughs> hair and watching all his Get Better Project videos. Ready? Go for the reveal. Woo! It's like, it's like you look like a different person. I, I, I can't put my camera on because I'm still in my, my house. I'll put it on for a second here. Can't even see me because I'm headed down in the, hey guys, look at my glasses. You know, what's up? It's me. I'm hiding <laughs> down here. I haven't even taken a shower yet from homeschooling this morning. So I'm hiding so, from you guys. Something that people need to know then is that we're actually putting this on YouTube with video. So if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, you should head over to the Seattle Investors Club YouTube channel and check this out because you'll at least get to see my crazy hair. Sean looks all pretty over there. You'll see that. He does. And, uh, he always looks pretty. You, you guys always look pretty. <laughs> I've been enjoying. I want to know... I want to know how many wall squats have you done in the last like 10 days, man? Every time I jump on social media, I'm like, there's Joe sitting against the wall doing wall squats. Next thing I know, I I see Jimmy Tang on there doing squats. Jimmy, if you're listening, I hope your legs hurt. (laughs) Right? Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, I love seeing Jimmy on there rolling and and taking the, the selfie there. I was like super stoked to see that. Yeah, so I want to. I just want to give a shout out before we kick off here today. If you guys like myself, uh, need to get moving, you know, get some, get some, get your body moving. You guys, absolutely. If you have not checked into the Get Better Project that my partner here, Joe Bauer, has founded, uh, instructional fitness videos, a whole community. Joe, I'll let you speak about it and drop something in the. Uh, Show notes today about it, Joe. You guys are you guys are missing out uh, for sure. Heck yeah! Well, it's it's designed to be done at home. So if you have an at home gym or no equipment at all, that's what it's designed to do or to be for. And it's based around the workouts that Emily and I have been doing with our two dumbbells out of the van. So we 
we've proven that that works for the last two years and that's where the workouts come from. And then we move them around to where you're at, meaning like maybe you don't have any equipment or maybe you've got a full gym. I know Sean used to have a full, super awesome gym that he was throwing stuff around in. Um, but it's, it's basically meeting where you, you, where you're at. We've got videos that show you how to do the workouts from a coaching perspective every day. We do daily challenges. We help people with their nutrition, with their stress, with their sleep. Um, it's been really fun. So people can uh, so awesome. check that out at the getbetterproject.com or hit me up personally. Definitely one of my daily entertainments is to see <laughs> what you guys are up to for sure. But speaking of dumbbells, we have the opposite of dumbbell. Dumbbell sounds like Dumbo to me, but we have the opposite. We have one of the smartest, sharpest, and most handsome fellas that we know on with us today. Back in action again with us, Mr. Sean Katona is back with us today doing a check-in here. Sean, what's up? Dude, I am blushing. I am laughing. You guys are cracking me up. And I'm just reminiscing about my Get Better Project journey because <laughs> Joe's been kicking my behind for months and months now. And uh, all sorts of fun memories and time lapses of me doing ridiculous workouts in there. The time right on, right on. <laughs> Well, if you are listening today and you have not yet met our friend, Mr. Sean Katona, Sean is the managing partner of Simplified Properties, which is a commercial and residential development company. Uh, he's an experienced real estate investor, a landlord, a speaker, and a coach with Fortune Builders, if any of you from Fortune Builders are listening. Um, and as I noted on our previous podcast, there's one small flaw uh, with Sean, and that is um, that he is a husky. So I need to say, right. go Cougs. I need to shout that out, right? Um, why I love Sean, guys, is because he's one of us. And when I say he's one of us, right, that means that he has been in the trenches. I mean, he has been slogging it out for at least 10 years, uh, you know, and, you know, not, we don't need to listen to all this guru stuff. We're going to listen to a guy that is, like I said, been through the ringer, learned everything, had to pivot, decided what asset classes, tried all kinds of different things. And I think, you know, I was uh, scrolling around on uh, something the other day, I think on my Facebook or something, and I checked in with what Sean was up to. And I saw, man, what a great video. He has some of the best content. I love Sean's content. It always looks good. And if you're looking on YouTube right day, you can see how how tight this guy is with his beautiful cabinets in the background. He looks so, we were like, where'd you get those? Those are pretty styling, man. But, uh, you know, that's why we want to hear from Sean because he's, you know, he is very thoughtful about how he coaches and gives advice. And um, today what we're going to kick it off with, with Sean is um, his top 10 real estate investing breakthroughs for the last 10 years. So Sean, just a little background, he owns income property across four states. Um, he has spearheaded over 70 deals, ranging from value-add renovations on single families to new construction. Um, but today, what he focuses on, unless we're going to find out differently during, during the COVID uh, crisis that we're in, but he's been focused on revitalizing um, retail shopping centers and apartment buildings to maximize returns for his friends and families these last several years. So, um, Sean, what's up, brother? Good to be with you guys again. Excited to be back. Awesome stuff. Um, I think I'm just quoting something off of some something that I saw in some of your content. You said, set a goal so big that you can't achieve it until you grow into that person who can. That's, is that a, that's a, we'll call that a Sean Katonaism. Yeah. Cause I haven't found who to credit that with, but I just love kind of the, the, the ethos of it. Right. It's, you know, we're all constantly growing in a lot of different ways. And so that, that, you know, kind of captures that idea of, man, if I, if I, you know, set a goal so high, I have to literally become a stronger entrepreneur or investor or, you know, fortify with a team. Like there's, there's just so many things that that gets my mind racing about, um, about how we can personally grow and then also our businesses and our portfolios. Exactly. Well, let's jump into it today and we'll start, we're going to kick this off with the top 10 real estate investing breakthroughs that you've had over the last 10 years. Cause I just find it valuable. It's simple yet straightforward. And I think a great message for everybody these days. Um, and then we're going to, well, then we'll jump into what you're doing in your business right now. Um, so the first one, 
Do you want me, maybe I'll, I'll kick them off I'll, and let you then respond to them. How about that? You want me to do it that way? Beautiful. Sound good to you? Okay, number one, um, uh, you say, get started sooner. That done is better than perfect. Give us a deep dive. Yeah, yeah. So I guess just to give like a little bit of context and, and frame this whole thing, I, I had had a few friends and family kind of reach out and you're like, you know, Sean, as you reflect back on all these these deals and these different asset classes and these different markets that you've been doing in, like what would what would you teach, you know, your younger self or what would you teach your kids as they're getting started on this journey or what do you wish you knew a decade ago as you were getting going? And so I was just kind of reflecting back and, you know, thinking about all the scars and the scrapes and the bruises and the lessons learned the hard way and you know, I've, I've lost money on deals. I've, I've eaten ish many times. Um, and so it's just, you know, as I, I thought about that, these were kind of the things that were like, you know, a little more than the one or two yard runs down the field, but like the 50 yard bomb or the touchdown pass or something that was like fundamentally changing as opposed to just like a tactical thing. And it's like, as I was able to, to embrace this like principle or concept, I think it really helped us you know, as a family, as an individual, and as a business to, to leap forward in a much stronger way. And so that's, that's kind of how these came to be. But with that first one, you know, it largely has to deal with analysis paralysis and people just trying to find the perfect deal or the perfect market or the perfect partner. And, and there's just no such thing, right? Because any deal, especially if you're doing value add, is going to have some sort of hair on it and trying to you know, time exactly when to buy. It, it just leads a lot of people to looking back years and years later going, man, I, I wish I would have bought in 2007 or eight or nine, you know, when prices were at an all time low. And man, why didn't I lock in a 4% interest rate? Like that hindsight is 2020. And so if we can get ourselves in a place where we're more confident and more comfortable, oftentimes through education, you know, we can power through some of that analysis process to actually take action. And, you know, one of the things that I, I highlighted in that top 10 was the for profit centers of real estate, which, you know, it's easy to forget when you're in like the chaos of everything. So you think about let's own, owning a, a rental property or even a commercial building, but we have cash flow coming in on that. We have a tenant paying down our loan. We have rents typically bumping to 3% every year. Um, and then we have tax advantages like depreciation, then all four of those things can get compounded. And so it's, it's not uncommon to see, you know, returns well into the double digits, in some cases, 20, 30% on individual deals when you account for all those things together. And not everyone's thinking about that stuff, you know, when you're comparing it to the market or other things that you can invest in. And so I think it's just, it's a good reminder for, for me, for my friends, my family and everyone, you know, as they think about buying and holding for the long term, particularly. So uh, is that a vote for skipping, flipping and going straight to buy and hold? Because I sort of feel that way a little bit. I'm not going to say no, because for a lot of folks, that's necessary for capital formation um, to, to get, you know, the, the cash to build or grow your business, to buy a rental, to put a down payment down. Um, what's ironic is that, you know, as I think back on my career, I might have been better off just continuing to work my, my day job. You know, I had a good, good gig in corporate America, healthy salary. And if I just deployed that into passive income, I might have skipped a lot of that roller coaster ride of, you know, losing money on flips and a lot of the headaches with contractors and, you know, things that I missed in due diligence and just some of the things you don't know you don't know when you're getting started. Uh, and that's that's going to vary. Like if you hate your job uh, and you want to become, you know, the next HGTV star, like flipping and wholesaling is a is a big part of that journey in that business. You know, if you're a high income earner and you're more interested in growing that nest egg or finding tax havens um, or, you know, gr- let's say you're growing your medical practice, you just want to get your dollars working as hard as you do. You know, arguably, I think I think there's a lot of reasons to to think more about the passive versus the active side, and for that matter, it's it's taxed a lot better too. Word agreed there. Good point. Well, let's go on to number two. Number two uh, in the top ten real estate investing breakthroughs of the last ten years by Mr. Sean Katona is outsourcing. Yes. Yeah, so when I thought about 
all the things that I did wrong on deals, like the, the list was long. <laughs> and I just recognized um, not as quickly as I should have that, you know, I'm not good at a lot of things. Uh, but what I could do is is quarterback and put the right people in place or put the right teams in place or the right processes or technology or whatever it is that we are trying to accomplish. Like generally, I wasn't the best person for the job. You know, you put a hammer in my hand, something gets broken. Um, and the same goes for like paperwork and detail oriented type of things. It's just, you know, I, I'm better off leaving that to accountants and to attorneys. And, you know, as soon as I could afford to do so, you know, the QuickBooks comes off your plates and, and the legal reviews. And, you know, in, in the case of commercial now, it's, you know, attorneys draft those leases and those purchase and sale agreements because I'm tapping into their 20 plus years of knowledge doing it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times so that I can kind of stand on their shoulders as opposed to trying to figure it out on my own. When what, what has been your top, what are your top three best outsourcing things that you do? You know what's wild now, Julie? Like I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate today that I can outsource almost everything. Um, in the beginning, that that obviously wasn't the case, right? You're just you're shorter on money, and you're trying to grass roots it and, and kind of boot it up. But you know, I, almost the only two things that I really do now are find great new deals, and then you know work with my friends and family to help them understand you know what those deals look like. So it's find deals, raise private equity. And everything else in my mind is lower value um, that I can pay someone to do uh, so that I can be freed up to do the things that lead to, you know, in theory, a seven figure payday. So if somebody was just getting started out or let's say they've done, let's say they've done, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, nine deals, something like that. What do you think the best outsourcing, you know, they, this might be a good time to say, uh, we want to remind you guys about uh, our friend Mike Motorbike and the book Profit First. Um, as you're getting started with your business, you might as well set up yourself the right way. And one of the best ways to, 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 to keep track of all that is to actually know how much money you have to spend on the different areas of your business and stop yourself from taking money out of one pocket or of your business into another. And so we are going to remind you guys, we're trying to get a Mike McCallowitz is coming back on the podcast soon, but we want to remind you guys all about the book profit first. Um, and you can learn more about that, uh, in our episode show number 38, but that's just a good, we wanted to plug that in there because it's a good timely time to, if everybody's recalibrating right now or has a minute to get some more systems set up for their outsourcing and keeping track of their stuff, boy, is that a good time to check in on the book, The Profit First and get your accounting systems set up to protect you from yourself, actually. <laughs> you know, so if you haven't read that, read that. But so top three outsourcing uh, things as you're, you know, within your first 10 deals, like you kind of made some money, you're not crushing it yet, but you, yeah. you have a little bit of ability to, uh, you know, to outsource. What do you think? My guess is it's going to be different for almost everyone, but like, I would take a look at your weekly calendar and be like, okay, what is my time being spent on this week? And if you see huge blocks of time doing stuff that's low value activities where you could pay someone 10, 15, 20 bucks an hour to solve a problem, like that's low hanging fruit. So like free up your time. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's my most precious commodity, right? If I can get my time back, I can do one more deal. And if that's, you know, a wholesale, I don't know if that's five or 10 grand, if it's a flip, maybe I'm making 30 or 50,000. And if I can buy another, you know, commercial property this year, I know that that could lead to six figures of passive income. Um, and that's the, you know, those hours are my most precious commodity. So I'll just, I'll give you a few like thought starters, like, you know, you shouldn't be writing your own direct mail, right? That's something that could be outsourced to like true professionals. A lot of marketing things. If you're not great at marketing, there's so many wonderful shops that do that. Obviously contractors. I did a lot of GCing on jobs where I'm managing all these different subs just so I could have a little bit better profit margin. But how much time did I spend doing adult babysitting uh, on mm -hmm. job sites times five different job sites. And you just start to go crazy. And I'm like, man, my full-time job now as a GC, like that's not why I got into this business. And so, you know, that, that really helped me get some clarity on, wow, 
while I'm saving 30, 40 bucks an hour, I, the opportunity cost of missing, you know, when I'm doing what I should be doing, it could be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars an hour in value creation, which is hard to be disciplined about. Cause you know, my whole childhood growing up, it was like, look, if you want to do something right. You got to do it yourself and, you know, be busy and, and, and all this stuff. And so it's just like this, this like, feeling that we need to be doing is so counterintuitive that I had to like rewire the circuitry a little bit. Exactly. I mean, and it could be as simple as uh, having somebody clean your house or something like that, you know, to free up your time. Right. I, I have a guy, I love you, Kirk, if you're out there listening and he is my go-to guy for everything. Plus he has a license so he can access houses and everything. He does everything for me. If I need anything done right now, I've got a condo that we rented one of our rentals and uh, you know, it needs to have some minor stuff done. Right. And I'm paying more than I should per hour to have him go over and take care of it. Right. And do all these little things that I could do, but man, you know, instead I get to focus on my business, right. Having, you know, like finding uh, like an all around go to, I, that's what I do is I have somebody that's like my all around go to for my life, almost like a house manager on call. You know yeah. what I mean? Where I can, uh, quarterback time consuming tasks done, including like getting my mother's prescriptions. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy enough. That takes an hour, you mm-hmm. know, stuff like that. So outsourcing, good one, right? Um, number, let's go to number three. You say uh, all markets are not equal um, and that you don't buy where you're from uh, or where you live. Tell us about that. Yeah, and that's obviously changed over time. Like a lot of folks know I grew up in Seattle. Uh, I, you know, I still own rentals there today. I did a lot of flips up there. Today I live in Southern California but regardless of where we live, like what I'm thinking about when I'm going to do a buy and hold uh, is, you know, what's happening with that economy, right? There's this national economy, but like no one owns property in the national economy. You own in Seattle or you own in Kirkland or you own in Tacoma uh, or you own in Dallas or you own in Phoenix. And so I'm looking at things like rent to price ratio. I'm looking at job growth. I'm looking at where companies are moving those jobs to. Is it a environment that's landlord friendly versus more tenant friendly? Uh, I'll give you a hint. California and Washington are very different than Texas with what landlords can do. And so there's just some things there that, you know, if you're, if you're going to be leaning more towards, let's say, passive income and long term holds, uh, stuff to think about, especially if you can get comfortable not driving by your property. If you don't need to touch it and see it and feel it, like, that can eliminate a lot of the, the time and, and the concern. So I, I'll just give you kind of an extreme example, but a couple of the rentals that I own in Dallas, I've never seen them, right? I, I bought them through a turnkey operator. Um, they renovated them. They installed the tenants. They collect the rents. They don't know my name. And it's just very much set it and forget it and get double digit returns. Plus those four profit centers that we talked about earlier. And same goes for commercial now. Like, I can I can get my dollar to stretch twice as far outside of Orange County that I could here in my backyard. Exactly. So speaking of turnkey rentals and buying turnkey rentals, you know, do you do you think about like I think about people individually, like you can invest for cash flow, you can invest for appreciation, or you can invest for both if you can find markets mm-hmm. that have both. Sometimes it's hard to get both, right? You can force both with value add. But, you know, thinking about people and just like an average person and just the one, you know, any of us, right, where we have X amount of, it's so individual what people's needs are, right? And it makes sense to me. I'm just talking here, guys. I'm not, you know, the expert here, just talking out loud with my friends and sharing it with all you guys, you know, to get your cash flow covered first, like your number one thing, if you want to have freedom of time, which will give you the freedom to do bigger deals and to focus more, you know, is getting some cash flow going. And it seems like one of the ways to do that would be like buying turnkey rentals in markets that have appreciation like that, right? Totally. Totally. And, and like Memphis versus Dallas maybe is a good example, right? Memphis people don't expect a whole lot of appreciation to occur. You know, Dallas maybe a little bit more, but your cash flow isn't quite as sweet. 
Um, and then there's going to be places in between, right. That have like kind of a hybrid of those two. And so very much like, I think that's an individual or a family decision, you know, what's your priority. And if you're not desperate for that cash flow right away, you're like, I like my job, I'm going to continue working, but you know, I want to deploy it in a market in the path of progress, uh, and see, you know, values go up by 20% over the next 10 years, you know, it, versus, Hey, I need the absolute best cash on cash return that I could possibly get. So I would weigh those two or even think about diversifying, right? You could own three rentals in each of those three markets and have a pretty good exposure in your portfolio. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a good idea not to own everything in one market. I don't know, you know, on those cash flowing turnkey rentals and those types of markets, I wonder how bad those have been hit recently though. Do you, I know if you have some yourself, have you had any impact on those? Knock on wood, um, all my residential tenants are doing fine. And that's in both Washington, California, and Texas. Um, the commercial shopping center is a little bit of a different story, but we can come yeah, to that later. We'll get to that, right? Exactly, guys. So, you know, as you know, we're lucky enough to have our friend Jennifer Beatles here locally in the Washington area. Um, and we've had her on our podcast recently as well. And she is a great resource for buying out of state properties, whether that be single family rentals or multifamily. Um, if you guys haven't plugged into Addicted to ROI and Jennifer Beatles, you are absolutely missing out if you're here in the Washington area where she's at. And she is, you know, uh, has a steady flow of deals. Sean, if you haven't jumped on that and you're interested in buying those deals as well, even like, you know, 12 unit buildings and things like that and markets like Tennessee, you should jump on uh, with Jennifer Beatles and uh, get on her list. Really, really professional, fantastic service that she has there. Um, so we'll move on. Number four, um, path of progress on the top 10 real estate investing breakthroughs. Path <laughs> of progress. Let's see. So I, what I was thinking about when I was reflecting back on this one was buying a decent house in a terrible neighborhood. <laughs> and you're like, wow, I, I turned this thing around. It's got beautiful finishes and uh, a lot of curb appeal now, but no one wants to live here. No one wants to raise their kids in this school district. And I kind of hit this limit of what the neighbor could, neighborhood could support on value. So you know, really what I wanted to be focusing on going forward was I want to buy the crappiest house in a very sought after area. And if you haven't done this a lot of times, uh, you can kind of lose sight of that. You're like, oh, I got a great deal here. It's at a deep discount. But you know, I hadn't thought about the fact that there's not a lot of people who really seek to live here unless they have to. Uh, and the same could be said for commercial, right? When I think about a shopping center uh, and how I could lease it up, you know, there's certain places with car counts and demographics and income where a retailer wants to locate and they're highly sought after locations. Think about Maine and Maine. Is, it, let's just say a tenant went out because of something like COVID. It would backfill immediately because it is such a desirable place for businesses to locate. The foot traffic is tremendous. The rooftop density is strong. And so, you know, you could get a steal of a deal out in the middle of nowhere, but it doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you can't keep the occupancy up and then, you know, execute on your business plan, whether that's flipping it or renting it or, or you know, forcing appreciation into it. Right. So the point being buy not nice properties in a nice area instead of buying in war zones because you get a good deal that nobody really wants to be in. Seems like a no brainer, but uh, ask me how I know. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I have friends that invest out of state here in the Washington interior. And I'm like, well, you bought that for what? And you know, yeah, yeah. I go, well, how, how hard is that to manage? Like, is it, are you just getting, is it a constant management headache? And sometimes the answer certainly is yes. Right. So finding that, finding that threshold where you can get over the constant crap related to it or the issues with bad tenant profiles and stuff like that. There's definitely some balance in understanding uh, what you say there on what you call path of progress. Um, like you said, I think you said I can change a property, but I can't change what's around it. Yeah. I think a zip, a zip code, a street or a whole neighborhood, like you're just not going to be able to make an impact. We can do anything with a property, right? We can, we can completely remodel it. You can gut it. You can tear it down and build a new one. Um, but it's, it's a lot harder to change an entire area. You're not right. going to do it. So number five is actually my, my favorite. 
Mm-hmm. Number five and actually number number seven maybe. But number five is what we're on. And what you say on there is get laser focused and specialize. It, particularly relevant for someone like me. And I'll, and I'll just give you a couple of examples, right? Like when I got started on my journey, I was working in corporate America, learning about residential, learning about wholesaling, learning about rentals, learning about flipping. You know, then you start learning about new construction and then you get, you know, sucked into teaching other people and traveling around the country. And then you got this shiny object of commercial and apartments and you're doing it in Seattle and you're doing it in Southern California. And like, I was, you know, the jack of all trades, master of none. And, you know, it was okay because I learned a lot. I got, I've got a very, you know, diverse set of, of knowledge and experiences that I can reference. But, you know, as I started to really hone in on, like I said, a, a single asset class in a single market, you can know it like the back of your hand. And Julie, you know this, like any good agent, you know, in a farm area, they could recite, you know, what are the comps? What is it going for price per foot? Like how many offers? How, how much is it selling for over ask price? And like, you just know that stuff. And, you know, for me now, that's, that's you know, more the Phoenix market and shopping centers. But I can tell you, you know, the rent rate per foot by neighborhood, by town. I can tell you, you know, what tenants are looking and which ones aren't. And I can tell you, you know, what corners are sought after and which ones aren't. Because all I've done for the last, you know, 24 months is talk to leasing brokers, and buy sell brokers in that market and of that asset class and as that started to happen kind of you get all the other noise and distractions away you know you can you can be really focused and really thoughtful and really strategic and also really uh selective about what you buy like i i only need to do one or two or three juicy deals a year to have a very comfortable you know lifestyle and return for my friends and family that invest with us uh, and so it, I think that's that's something that Buffett has alluded to, right? It's like, just make a couple great decisions a year um, and, and you'll be in good shape and like hold this stuff for the long haul. Right. As opposed to previously where you're stressed and like you said, you know, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. I think you said that when you got laser focused, that your income went up 10 times over. I, I mean, it's it's 100% accurate, um, you know, that these bigger deals, you know, it's, it takes the same, well, I'm getting ahead of myself on some of these, these items, but you know, a a single transaction, you know, has the potential to, to kick off a seven figure payday or on a single deal, six figures in cash flow, And, you know, for most folks, that's going to be life changing, or at least give you, you know, the opportunity to decide, you know, do I want to keep working or do I want to keep flipping? Or do I want to, you know, have my significant other do what they're doing? Uh, and it's just that that freedom, that control, that choice. Um, it's a game changer. Well, let's keep cooking so we can get to that one. It's number six on the list: solve a big problem. The bigger the problem, the bigger the payday. Okay, so so as I thought back about my best deals versus some mediocre or some thin ones, like the common theme was that. I was working with a more motivated seller, right? Someone who had a real problem that I could add substantial value to. And that comes in a lot of shapes and sizes, right? It can be physical, you know, condition of a property. It can be someone's financial um, situation, or it could just be situational, right? You think about like divorce or, or probate or like a lot of the things that people do direct marketing to. It's like, those are the types of scenarios where, you know, their best solution may not be listing it with an agent on the MLS. They might prefer the certainty of an all cash buyer, or they might prefer working with someone who doesn't need to use a bank, right? They can come in and close all cash. And so, you know, understanding that and really weeding out saying, look, you know, I think the best solution for you, Mr. and Mrs. Seller would be to go ahead and list it. You know, I'm going to refer you to Julie. She's a phenomenal agent. Um, every deal she's done with me has gone for over asking. Uh, this is going to be your your best resource. And now that's off my plate, right? And I'm focusing back on the seller who really, you know, can have a win-win with me on the transaction. Uh, and so again, like it, it tends to be that more motivated individual. And that's, that's the number one thing that I think about now. It's like, is this person going to receive huge value from transacting with me? And then let's think about what needs to happen with the property. 
In your past, when you were, you know, getting started and slogging your way through all the fix and flip stuff and all that stuff, did, were you taking on deals? Were you doing deals that you now look back on and were like, I did that just to keep going and to get a deal done to, to make myself feel like I'm doing deals. And how do you feel about that now? Totally. It, like it becomes this like drug almost, or like it, people want to flex their, their deal volume. And so like my thing is like, oh, I keep doubling every year. It was six deals and then it was 12 deals. And then I had, you know, 20 going simultaneously. And like, like that was some sort of badge of honor when really it was just a hot mess in the background. Part and- of it is an image thing you want to display, right? When you're younger, when you're getting started and you think, and people think that that's important and they realize maybe it's all a bunch of not important, right? And, it- and doing what you're doing now. And, and- and especially if they're not going really well, like if you're not executing, like I could do two deals and have them actually be more profitable than 10, you know, mediocre or thin deals. And so some people get into a situation where, you know, you've got overhead or you've got staff or you're kind of like feeding this beast or the machine. And it's very much the same case with like the biggest players in, in commercial or multifamily, right? You've got these funds and you've got to deploy tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, and you've got a hundred people on staff and overhead. And so like they have to be buying, trading, transacting, generating fees in order to cover their nut and their overhead. Um, and so like, you know, I kind of, I kind of went that opposite direction. It's like, I got very lean. I got very minimalist. You know, I don't have a lot of overhead. Um, I want to work with the absolute best vendors or property managers or attorneys or contractors that I can afford. Um, but it's on a deal by deal basis to execute a very specific thing. Um, Awesome stuff. Hey guys, it's Julie here with a quick break from the show to discuss an opportunity some of you may have interest in, which is to work more closely with me. On almost a daily basis, I get calls from investors and brokers, both new and experienced, asking me for guidance or advice. I love helping you guys out and it keeps me on my toes too. So with that said, I wanted to let you know that I have a private broker coaching community called the VIP Education Community. And the best part is that it's 100% free. That's right. It's free to join. So whether you're a traditional broker or a broker investor, my VIP education community offers personalized one-on-one coaching from not just me, but also from my experienced broker friends with expertise in all disciplines of real estate and real estate investing. We'll teach and share our modern marketing strategies, our tech and lead generation resources, plus teach you how to identify or offer up opportunities for yourself or for your clients using tech techniques such as seller financing, lease options, land entitlement deals, burr investing, flipping, multifamily or commercial coaching, whatever you like, we've got it all covered for you. The future of real estate is changing fast and to stay in the game, it's time to learn about all the options you can offer your buyer and seller clients, as well as if you want, learn how to use those skills to grow your own real estate portfolio. If you'd like more details about joining my VIP education community, reach out to me at julie at seattleinvestorsclub.com or text me at 206-910-2985 or just send me a Facebook message. My new favorite phrase is community equals confidence. So let's navigate the future of real estate together. Now back to the show. Uh, My favorite. Now here's a good one. Bigger is better. Bigger (laughs) is better. Buy a duplex instead of a single family or buy bigger properties. You know, like you said, one $400,000 loan takes the same amount of effort probably as a $4 million loan. That is, that is my, my hundred percent feeling. That's how I roll. Um, and, and, you know, now you have learned that firsthand. Tell us about that. Number seven, lucky. (laughs) Yeah. I I mean, number seven, anyone who has really taken the time to understand the numbers or has done some volume of deals is, is probably going to appreciate this, right? It's like, you know, the amount of work to process a loan. And I don't care if that's a traditional loan for a bank and a rental property, or even working with a hard money lender or a private money lender, like it's paperwork, it's transactional time. um, It's negotiating a contract. It's, you know, understanding the due diligence. It's, you know, adjusting the price if need be on things that get discovered during an inspection period. Like all that stuff happens on all the deals. It's just, you know, if, if I'm, 
adjusting a price or let's be frank, retrading a deal on a commercial purchase, I might be asking for a 10% reduction. That could be $300,000. And you know, for me, it took a lot of flipped houses to get to that kind of value creation. So one negotiation, one time with one motivated seller can create that much value. And like similarly on the, on the flip side, if you're signing a lease with a substantial size tenant, one lease signed one time can create hundreds of thousands of dollars of value literally overnight. Um, and, you know, you talk to your loan brokers or your loan originators and what do they want to do? A bunch of little deals or bigger ones? You know, they get paid the same, the same proportional fee typically. And so my banker says, Sean, I, you know, I would much rather see you get into this price point of, of properties because I can qualify you for that dollar amount. Then you and I are doing less paperwork for these little ones. Okay. And all of a sudden I feel, you know, a lot more empowered to go out there and pursue slightly larger deals. Or, Let me or- ask you, how do you feel about, you know, I think people... Uh, don't jump into the bigger deals because in the beginning they think they're just not qualified. So they focus on doing, you know, maybe they need to flip, like you said, because that's their way of generating their cash flow. But maybe we're talking about people that <clears throat> have that down, right? And they're kind of stuck in their rent flipping. And maybe they just like, well, I don't understand. I don't understand how to do the bigger deals. Like, what does it take? You were that way. You were exactly that guy. You started with the small deals and one day the light turned on and you're like, what in the heck? And you started doing the bigger deals. You know, that commercial is totally different than residential. True. Multifamily is absolutely different than single family. Even if it's single family rental, multifamily is different. What do you, do you think that people just need to focus and educate and learn or, you know, what's holding people back from understanding that they're, they're capable of doing this. They just, they don't know what they don't know. I'll speak from my personal experience. And, you know, as I've talked to more friends and family about this, it, it seems to be kind of thematic, but first of all, awareness, right? I come from pretty humble beginnings. I didn't grow up in a family of people who owned substantial apartment buildings or commercial shopping centers or industrial warehouses. And so there just wasn't a lot in my neck of the woods to reference and be like, wow, that family is um, completely taken care of and affluent because they own a hundred doors. And so they're just literally, I was clueless first and foremost. And then um, the, the, sorry, phone call came in and just totally derailed me. So, so AI was clueless. There was no awareness of it. Uh, And then there's like the whole fear side of it, right? You're just like, oh my God, it's bigger. So it must be riskier. It's bigger. I don't have the money or it's bigger. I can't sponsor it, which is, which is a reality for some situations. But what people probably don't, again, like awareness realize is that you don't need to have every single piece of the puzzle to participate in a substantial deal right? You could be the person who has great credit and can help to sponsor the loan, or you've got a strong balance sheet and you could help to sponsor the loan, or you could have just found the deal of a lifetime from a very motivated you know, family who wants to unload it in their portfolio and say, Hey, I've got this. I don't know what to do with it, but I know to bring it to someone like Julie, or I know to bring it to someone like Joe, because they have the tools and the experience to be able to put a deal like this together. And so, you know, they help raise a million or two dollars and they secure a good loan and they can execute on a business plan to force appreciation. And now all of a sudden, you know, everyone's got a five or a 10% stake in this building that has seven figures of upside. So it was, you know, a combination of cluelessness, uh, you know, lack of knowledge and experience. And so, you know, what I did was go out and seek a ton of education. I read every book that I could. I, I, I found the gurus that I could. And I, I surrounded myself with people who were doing deals like this. And, you know, today I'm, I'm very thoughtful about, you know, who's in my speed dial list. And when I go on a, a vacation or I go to a retreat or I go to a symposium or something, it's like everyone in that room owns five or six or seven buildings. They're all multimillionaires. They've all done it dozens of times. And I'm the dumbest, brokest guy in the room, which is not a hard thing to accomplish, right? But, you know, you're very selective with what rooms you're finding yourself in. So I'm, you know, being lifted up by those people who've done it. And it's just like, wow, if you see that over and over and over again, you're like, I'm just looking at one seven figure check after another come in. I'm like, if they can do it, you know, with the same path, they went down the same journey that I did. Maybe I can do it too, you know, if I, 
gain that knowledge, if I understand those systems, and if I surround myself with like, you know, the same type of network to be able to execute on those things. And, and what do you think those parts of the puzzle are, Sean, for the bigger deals? There's finding the deal, which is the same, you know, it's, it's a different way of doing it on the commercial deals. Like we said, it's much more broker oriented probably, but I don't, we won't jump in that today because we're going to put you guys back to um, Sean's <clears throat> previous podcast number 84. Uh, and Joe will drop it in the show notes where we did more of a deep dive on exactly that sort of thing. But just to briefly on the overview of the parts, right? You got finding a deal, right? A good deal. You you have um, you have the business plan around the value add component, how to restabilize the deal, renovate and maybe restabilize it for a long term hold. You have the financing portion of it. I think that people probably can understand very easily the um, finding the deal and the business plan to not that you, you know, you need to school up and maybe partner up, like we said, on how to do the value add and execute it. It's the money part. People, you don't understand the money part. So when you first got started, That seems to me like the biggest hurdle. You can understand it. You can learn it. You can find the deal. You can understand the value add components and be willing to slog it out and and go through that. But how do you get the money you need to close on that 30% equity or, you know, that is intimidating. And how do you feel about that? Looking back, what I would have done differently is ride in the passenger seat with someone who's done it a bunch of times, um, because then I could see it from the inside. I could understand, you know, the life cycle of a deal from beginning to end. Because I, I think, you know, these numbers are substantial enough where if someone screws up a multi-million dollar deal like that that can that can blow a career out like right there. And so, I would not advocate for just like going and figuring it out, you know, on your own and trying to do this, but rather you know, you know, what I said I did is I surrounded myself with mentors and coaches and seasoned sets of eyes to poke holes in all my deals. And I must have offered on over a hundred properties, gone to LOI on contract on on dozens before I finally got one across the finish line. And like, I don't, that was inefficient. And I don't know why I did that because I was just, I was so excited. Like it was, it was again, like this, like pride and this badge of honor thing. Like I want to, I want to do it on my own, but you know, years went by before I finally made a payday, you know, in commercial real estate. And when I did, yes, it was substantial, but could I have shortened that learning curve substantially? Absolutely. And again, an individual needs to think about, you know, am I going to be a full-time syndicator in this business? Because if not, the economies of scale probably aren't there. Or am I looking to redeploy, let's say, I'm making all this money flipping houses and I'd like to have a stake in all these apartment buildings, uh, or I'm making all this money wholesaling, and now I own a chunk of these industrial complexes. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the mechanics of it, Julie, are relatively straightforward, right? I put together an offering. Uh, it's private equity. Everyone understands that there's risks. You know, I predominantly work with accredited investors uh, because, you know, that's what the SEC wants to see. Uh, and there's a very specific business plan to execute. And, and so that part isn't necessarily what, what I think is the hardest. Um, Cause you know, coincidentally, once you do a couple of these, it's like, I've got more cash that wants to come into deals and I have deals to put them into again. Um, the first one isn't, isn't the simplest. And so, you know, what was unique in my scenario is I had a lot of folks who had invested with me in residential. They'd done private loans. They understood the role of debt uh, and let's say a very predictable interest payment. What we did was educate and help them understand what does it look like when you're an equity partner? You know, are you doing preferred rates of return or waterfalls? Or are you doing a very, you know, straight, hey, you get 5% of the profit, 5% of the cash flow, 5% of the tax offsets, you know, and 5% of your capital back or proportionally back if we do a refinance. Like that stuff is all, you know, pretty, pretty black and white um, and driven by the managing partner of, of that deal. So again, I think, if, if someone were to take a couple courses and read a couple books, they'd, they'd have an understanding of what to do. Um, and then it's just developing mastery of, of those things. And then, like you said, go right along on somebody else's deal, right? I mean, I mean you're, that's... you're immediately making money. You're getting paid to learn. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I always have people like, why would you ever invest in a syndication Well, because I can go do what I want to do and the money shows up in my account. That's why. 
without doing any work. Oh, do, I'm sorry. Do you like double digit returns and tax offsets while someone else does all the grunt work in the ground game? Right. Yes. Yes. They get a piece of the pie and a chunk of the pie that I don't get, but guess what? I mean, unless I want to go do that myself, then I'm willing to give that up. Right. So I can focus on what I want to do. Case in point, I'm an active investor, right? I, I syndicate, I put, I put a deal together. I work with, you know, joint, member, but I'm also a limited partner and I passively invest. So, you know, we, we parked money into a $30 million apartment building class A just because I wanted to deploy the cash. I wanted to see how they run their business. I wanted to see, you know, operationally how this works on the multifamily side compared to retail. And so it's been A, awesome and B, uh, enlightening. Right. You get all the documents. You get to see what's going on. You get to see how it's done. I agree 100%. I do the same. All right, we'll move on because that was my favorite one. Number eight, and we'll bust through these tax advantages that are insane. <laughs> yeah, so so I, I'm particularly thinking about phantom losses, depreciation, and, and even accelerating our depreciation through a cost segregation study. And so I'll just like give a 30 second on that. So imagine, you know, all the components that go into a property or a building, you've got the walls, the floors, the furniture, the fixtures, and you know, the code says, you know, these all have a useful life. In residential, it's 27.5 years, but in commercial, it may not be that case. Or you might say, hey, the flooring is actually going to last five years. The lighting is going to last seven years. And so what happens is these engineering studies get done and they get componentized and you can create these paper losses, net operating losses. You're not actually losing money, right? But on paper, you're blowing through that depreciation, let's see in the first few years. And so it's created in an environment where I might have enough losses to offset all of my gains from my dental practice or my medical practice or my wholesaling business or my flipping business or, you know, all my income from the Get Better Project is being zeroed out by the net operating losses from my shopping center and from my apartment building. So that means Joe is paying how much in taxes? You know, depending on how all those numbers work out, it could zero him out completely. So that's just insane, right? Already you're earning it passively, so it's taxed at a lower rate. And then you might be completely zeroing out you know, your, your tax liabilities um, because of some of that NOL, net operating loss. Awesome stuff. If you guys want to learn some major nuggets about uh, these types of things that we're covering on this number nine with the tax advantages, these net operating losses and some of the new rules and some of the, the, the things that are related to this uh, COVID-19 crisis that we're in. We hope that you all, we want to tell you all, one of my favorite people that I've been following here for the last at least year is my friend, uh, Natalie, Natalie Kaladi. I don't know what uh, podcast number she was on, Joe, but maybe you can drop it in the podcast. We've had her on a couple times. If you aren't following her Natalie Kaladi and her last name is spelled kind of funky. It's K O L O D I J. She is dropping Sean. If you're not following her massive nugget bombs, real time, really good information that will directly affect your business. Sean, I know uh, as well as mine and everybody else's. Um, she is basically an accountant that specializes in real estate investing, but just the, just, she's able to pull the most pertinent information out of a lot of boring shit and tell us exactly straightforward (laughs) what we need to know. And we appreciate her and having her be involved in our world so much, but number nine, Julie, um, I'm, Let me just interrupt. I think I I need to like disclaim, like I'm not a CPA or a tax professional, right? So I'm not giving anyone tax advice, but also not a lot of people are necessarily talking about this. My CPAs didn't tell me this. And so, you know, what I would say is it's worth going out and pursuing some of this information uh, and understanding it better, especially if someone is a, a six figure earner, because that, you know, that's the situation where they're paying the highest tax rate. You think about federal and, and state and all the things. And so, you know, that, that is one of the, the most prudent things that I would do. You know, if I'm, if I have a very successful day job or active income businesses, you know, go understand their unique situation and have a CPA who is well-versed, like you said, specifically in real estate to, to take a look at what their opportunities are and say, Hey, you know, if I, 
was able to get a bunch of depreciation uh, as a part owner of one of these buildings, what would that do for us? Exactly. And you know, at what can you, I don't know if you can find while we're talking, Joe, the number of the podcast, we'll just say it here again, that Natalie did, I want to say it was in the nineties somewhere, but we literally on that podcast, she basically said, go get your tax return, look at line, whatever. And if this isn't on that line, you need to change CPAs. Mm -hmm. That podcast was rocking. And I think it was the one, Joe. 103. What? 103. Is that the one where the dog was snoring? Yeah. Okay. So there's many reasons to listen to podcast number 93 uh, of the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing. One of them is you're going to get told to go look at your tax return on a certain line item to check up on your CPA if you own rentals and stuff. And the other reason is because it's funnier than hell at about 26 <laughs> minutes in. If you haven't listened to it yet, we don't want to tell you what happens, but you'll figure it out and then come back and join us or post on the Seattle Investors Club Facebook page that you listen to podcast number 103 with Natalie and tell us, uh, tell us what you found there. It's hilarious. So we don't, want to, we don't want to blow that. Some of you already know, but some of you may not. So, all right. So that was the tax advantages, which is the huge part. It makes it worth uh, jumping into the bigger deals just all by itself as well. Um, number nine, I'm going to skip over, uh, go real quick, which is don't do this alone. Sean was your number nine tip on the top 10 real estate investing breakthroughs. Yep. We kind of covered that already. Um, and cause we're going long on time here, I'm going to skip to number 10, um, sort of the same, but do more partnering sooner in your career. Um, I mean, and I, I probably covered that adequately already, right? Just my example of you know, finding someone that you can ride in the passenger seat and understanding that each partner or, or player in a deal can bring something else to the table. So, you know, what do you have right now? You have time, you have money, you have good credit, and what don't you have? And we can fill that in. And so, you know, it might be the case where Julie and I are the perfect combination to take down a substantial deal together. Um, or, you know, you might realize I need two or three partners to take down a deal of, of a certain size. And so it's just understanding where you're at. And it's like any, nearly any deal is possible if you can bring the correct players in, into the, the, the fold to accomplish it. So I'm not, I'm, not, exactly. I'm not asking like if it's possible, but how. I always tell people the first thing you should do when you start real estate investing is people are like, yeah, yeah, what is it? They think it's going to be like, you know, some action. I my, you know, what I say instead is step back, sit down and think about what you bring to the table. What are you, what are your skills that you bring to the table? That could be things like you have money, right? Maybe you have money. You could bring that to the table. Maybe you don't have money, but you have time. Time is you if you can give your time to somebody, like I said, I got a guy that, that I pay that runs and does everything I could possibly get him to do. He has time. He brings that to me and I give, I treat him well. You know what I mean? He, I do anything for him. It's the same thing. Do you have time? Give your time. Do you have, you know, some skill set? Are you a general contractor? Are you a broker? Are you a whatever? What can you bring to the table, right? Think about that first. So when you go out and network, you are seeking out people and situations that you can contribute, whatever that is that you can contribute that need that need that you know an opposite skill set, right? So you have one skill set. The people you are seeking out have another skill set. That's all I'm saying. All right, let's jump down to it, Sean. Let's talk about today's today. It is what is it? April twenty eighth, two thousand twenty. We are in the height of the uh, the coronavirus COVID nineteen impacts to our our world and our economies and our real estate businesses. And first of all, um, we last time we had you on, it was last summer in, in about summer 2019. What have you been up to since then? Yeah, I think what happened is I, I had just sold um, one of my shopping centers in Arizona that we went full cycle on. So about 18 months from start to finish. And so that deal closed. Like I finally made the distributions to all the investors who are part of that project and, you know, made the most substantial deposit into our bank account that I have in, you know, my entire career um, by, by a wide margin. So congratulations, was, by the way, it was, I mean, talk about years and years of just 
you know, learning and, and kind of banging your head against a wall and, and getting through it to finally like get the fruits of our labor. And it's like, it's like a big thank you to my, to my wife who had the patience and the wherewithal to bear with me on that, but also to all the, the coaches and the mentors and like the, uh, the counselors along the way. Cause it takes like mental fortitude to, to, you know, go through something that you haven't done before and, and, you know, just kind of put a little bit of faith that it's, it's going to go to the end, like you'd hoped to. Did you end up doing a big case study on that? Uh, You know what? Um, So there's one in the works, Uh, Joe, I should, I should give you a link to that, but I'm I'm putting together, basically, I was going to call it the seven figure case study, which breaks down kind of the big things that you were talking about, Julie, like, how do you find it? How did you fund it? How did you fix it or force appreciation? And then how did you you flip out of it or or exit? And like, what was the result of that? The steps along the way? And, you know, how how did you, you do each part of, of the business uh, in that stage? Well, we'd love to have you back on, you know. Yeah, we can, we can do that. And, you know, I, I was going to make that just like a 10-minute video so someone could kind of watch it at their leisure and get, you know, an, an actual real numbers breakdown of exactly how sure. that went. Good stuff. Um, and let's see. So... In January, just a, a few months ago, I sold another shopping center. Um, that one went even better than the first, and it went even faster. It was about 14 months from start to finish, and I just got unbelievably fortunate with the timing. Like I sold it at the absolute peak at 100% occupancy um, and just, just put a truckload of cash in the bank. Um, and then in July of last year, probably like right when we were speaking, I bought another shopping center down in Tucson, um, which is fun because it's, it's Albertson anchored, all name brand tenants. Uh, and so that one's been a little bit of an interesting ride because of COVID. Like I've got a gym in there that just walked away on their lease with three years left and you know a lot of tenants that have been forced to close. And so we're working with those tenants to help them weather the storm. Uh, we've got good cash reserves so that we can kind of help them work their way through and restructure some of those leases. So hopefully they come out stronger at the end of this. Um, but I have put my acquisitions on pause, um, probably until Q4. Uh, I reserve the right to adjust that a little bit, but I think values are going to drop. Uh, I think brokers and owners are a little bit in denial. I can tell you from firsthand experience that it's just, it's ugly right now being an owner or a landlord of, uh, retail, particularly, you know, hotels are probably just going through a really rough patch right now too. Uh, when it comes to rent and collections, I mean, businesses literally can't open, can't make money, can't pay rent. And they're already, you know, a lot of them barely surviving, like living hand to mouth uh, month in and month out. And so just being closed for a few days, their cash is zero and their ability to pay is zero. So what does that mean? Um, I think that the opportunity that's coming, there's going to be a cleansing of this asset class and an absolute tsunami. And I think I, I may have mentioned this to you earlier, but I'm going to be going on a shopping spree of shopping centers uh, probably later in this year and into early 21. I think we are going to have the buying opportunity of the decade, uh, if not in, in, in someone's lifetime. And so I'm assembling my own cash and, you know, just educating my friends and family about, you know, what, what's ahead and the opportunities that are going to exist for us to own some of the highest quality assets at some of the best cost basis that I, I think we'll see in our lifetime. Are you worried about, you know, for me, that seems like this whole coronavirus thing and I'm no health expert. You guys are probably even more so than me on this topic and paying attention, but it could end up being an on and off thing that happens right in the future going forward. Right. It, it could come and go and come and go, come back. We have to contain it. Everybody's going to shut down. And we, you know, how, how, as far as retail goes, are you you planning to buy these properties and operate them as retail, or you're going to repurpose them somehow? Or what's the risk with this type of pandemic affecting retail almost probably as much as more than anybody more. Uh, you know, biggest asset class I would think probably yeah. the be- one of the best asset classes you could have you know, are uh, always multifamily, maybe of certain classes, B class probably, or warehouse, warehouse to me, you know, with all these, you know, people might start using shared warehouse space more or just in general. I mean, warehouse space 
seems to be a good one. But retail, I mean, I'm not in the retail business. I, I've owned a retail shopping center. I used to own a 45,000 square foot value add retail shopping center. And we went, I owned it during the last time this went down and we had to write a check for 2 million bucks because of uh, really because our loan needed to be refinanced during the time period, yep. which sucked. Yep. Right. So uh-huh. tell me, what are you thinking for retail? Why do you want to continue buying retail? Okay. So I'm a contrarian, right? Everyone else is drawn to multifamily because it's the lowest risk and it's been the least impacted by this. And, you know, the apartment building that we, we own is at 94% collections. And so it's like relatively unimpacted in the grand scheme of things. Retail, on the other hand, is just absolutely getting pummeled, right? And so the values there are going to tank. And, you know, personally, I've lost 25% of my rent roll. So you think a building that was, you know, 20% vacant now is almost you know, 40% vacant, give or take. And so that directly impacts the value of the property. And so if I was going to go buy a value add deal, well, now there's more so than there's ever been. Um, But what you're going to have to underwrite into that is, hey, there's going to be a lot more choice for tenants. You know, you may not command nearly as high of rents, but if I can buy it for half of what it's going to be worth, like that to me is a pretty compelling value proposition. But I'm doing it in deals where, it's something that still needs to be retail, right? So where are you going to get your nails done when this is all said and done? Where are you going to get your hair cut? Where are you going to go get your dog groomed? Um, where are you going to go to the gym? And like, yes, that's going to change a little bit, but there's going to be some things that fundamentally just like you're still going to go to storage. You might do it with gloves. You might do it with masks. You might do it in you know, very different ways with hygiene, but like, I, I don't think retail completely goes away. There's going to be a continued cleansing of that asset class. Like we've already seen for many years, right? You see it with Sears, you see it with JC Penney's, like all these big boxes were just dinosaurs that weren't adapting and paying attention to what was going on with e-commerce and Amazon. And so like, you know, I would continue to lean towards service centric daily neighborhood needs types of things. And just think about it, right? Like in the era post COVID, or if this does continue to happen in a cyclical fashion, like what are you going to do about your nails? What are you going to do about your hair? You're still going out to get groceries. Like some parts of our lives have changed in a big way and others have changed. Like are people going to stop going to restaurants? Yeah. I, I doubt it. Like, I think it's, it's. I think my fear in that, cause I lived through that on my own, you know, retail center is that really uh, you can control that in your own shopping center. Right. But the problem is, is the, the vacancy and, you know, anything that, you know, the demographic of what's available in the absorption of the market. Right. So we got nailed. We, we got nailed partially. I kind of got thrown into the deal because I'm a problem solver. So they give me a big piece of the pie of this deal just to literally walk in and said, hey, Julie, we bought this. We just gave you, you know, 18% of this deal. Congratulations. And threw the keys on my desk and go, go figure that out. Mm. Get it done. Do the veneration. Lease it up. I didn't have a, a kind of a choice, right, at that, on that particular deal. And frankly, what happened is that when they bought it, they – they didn't look hard enough about the fact that there was room to build. And so we got nailed with a bunch of new shopping centers being built that needed to be leased up. It compressed our rents, you know, that we started off that way. Um, And and for me, it was just a great lesson in um, again, not having specialty build outs like a, a, like a, we had a anchor of a fitness center, a 24 hour fitness. um, And that was just too big of an anchor for that type of shopping center because it impacted us huge when, you know, if they had a problem and things like that. So Mm -hmm. I'm almost, you know, I don't know. I'm just talking out loud. I have no idea. It seems like having smaller spaces rather than huge anchors. So you don't get, you know, on your stacking plan there, you know, nailed and then being real careful about your, when your loans mature, um, you know, but I, I'm worried about the absorption of the issues of the other shopping centers in the area having mm-hmm. problems and dropping their rents to like, you know, eight bucks a square foot or something like that, you know. And, and that becomes part of the strategy, right? If you've got the lowest cost basis of all the shopping centers around you and you can offer the best value, 
um, compared to the other landlords, like you've got a competitive advantage and, and you know, buying something distressed, you know, that's been taken back by the bank you know, allows you to pick it up at 50 cents on the dollar. You can afford to offer rents that are better than the shopping right. center across the street and you can make it look better. And so, you know, those, those tenants are going to land somewhere and I just want to be positioned to get them, you know, the most compelling deal possible. And I think, you know, Julie, you brought up a good point. It's like, man, if you're stepping into a deal that's already a disaster, it's, it's tough. You know, if we can do some forecasting and see what's coming and be very strategic and, and very thorough in our due diligence, you know, we can understand very clearly what we're buying, what the needs are for that center and like what, what tenants are just going to be clamoring to get into a box, let's say that hasn't been available in the last 10 to 20 years. Right. Uh, and, and, and look, I'm not going to pretend to in anything, right? For sure. For sure. And, and, and I think it's, it's changing so fast that I'm going to reserve the right to pivot. Um, Cause we just don't know. And you know, it's, it's an interesting time to be able to buy higher quality stuff than maybe I'd otherwise think right. about going into. Yeah, I agree. Same, same kind of uh, stock market idea with the stock market tanking. I've, I've jumped in myself with a very, yeah. very, very specific plan um, and it's working and, th- and that is really just positioning me to, you know, pick up very high quality, um, long-term, you know, it's not going to go away type of stuff that everybody's going to need no matter what the case is with our, you know, economy and our market here and, and trying to buy that when it's more affordable, um, you know, as part of my diversification plan as well. So, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens. We can't wait to see. So you're you're going to stick to your focus on on uh, uh, you're going to be like the retail expert guy, right? We don't need to call any brokers. We'll just call you. Oh, so hardly. I I call brokers all day long, and I don't know. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends have encouraged me to take a hard look at like uh, some of the small bay warehouse type of stuff. I mean, that's just on fire right now. I think I want to wait and see what happens with the election coming up here because that could fundamentally change things quite a bit. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Q4, I'm just, I'm getting all the dry powder ready. I continue to talk to my brokers. Like I'm, you know, I'm just pouring over, you know, the news and understanding, you know, what tenants are going under and, and which ones, I mean, some, some categories are thriving and growing. You look at Costco and Home Depot right now, like they're just, they're on fire. So, you know, we're, we're, there's this, again, this cleansing of what's going on. So what about repurposing retail centers for if they're zoned appropriately? I don't know. Right. Yep. Um, I mean, there's going to be a lot of, if you can pick up that kind of stuff and get those rezoned or, or not rezoned, but if they're within zoning, that would allow a higher and better use and getting those entitled. Woof. Totally. Like co- really- covered land play. Like these tenants are covering my nut, you know, it allowed us to right. get the dirt at a very good price. Now we can put, you know, four stories of multifamily on top of ground floor retail and, you know, quadruple the value of what, what was here previously. Like that is absolutely on the table. I've never been a big fan of new construction and development because I like buying something substantially below replacement cost, which is coming. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Well, good stuff. Good stuff. You guys follow along with Sean, what he's up to. Jump on his Facebook page at Simplified Properties uh, or follow along. Sean, how can people follow along or learn more from you on a regular basis? So you know what I did because I had enough requests uh, at SeanKatona.com. I have my top 10 video there like on demand so someone could grab it. Um, and what I'll add to that is just a typed up PDF. So someone could like download the cheat sheet or the swipe file and, you know, share this with a buddy or a significant other and, and like a, a six minute version versus the one hour version. Um, cause we, we dove pretty deep into a lot of these things, but that's a, that's a good succinct overview. Um, you know, what you were talking about looking at Julie. So seancatona.com has that. And, you know, you guys Google me, you can find me. I'm, I'm everywhere on the socials. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, Joe, I'll have to send you that link to the seven figure case study. Maybe that's a wait list. It's not, it's not produced yet, but it uh, should be pretty fun and, and be enlightening for a lot of folks who take a look at it. Yeah. If you guys want to get a hold of that uh, and you want that sent to you when it's available, just, uh, sorry, Joe, I'm going to use you. Hit up Joe at seattleinvestorsclub.com um, or drop it in the uh, the uh, show notes or however they can do it. Joe, you tell them how to do it. I don't know how this works. I'm just here doing the talking. 
Yeah, that's fine. They can email me, Joe, at SaleInvestorClub.com or contact us in any way that they are comfortable with. We'll get it. Awesome stuff, guys. Well, we want to remind you also that if you want to plug in, um, if you want to plug in to us and uh, sorry, now my phone's ringing. It's that time of day. Trying to get some business done here. Um, Every Thursday, no matter where you're at, whether you're in, you know, Washington or Oregon or California or Miami or wherever you're at, we have an online meetup that happens every single Thursday at 1130 a.m. You can find the link. It's a Zoom meetup. Uh, every Thursday, and you can grab that off our meetup.com page for seattleinvestorsclub.com. Just go there, grab the link, make sure you got the right date on there, grab that link and join us um, because we're really talking about stuff that, that is national, right? Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, only fit to us here in the Pacific Northwest, and um, we have a great conversation every week at check-in because the market and our lives and real estate and everything affecting us um, is, ha- is changing right now daily and weekly. And so it's a really great place to take an hour to check in with your peers. It's just a peer to peer open discussion. Um, and you're able to unmike yourself and ask whatever questions that you want. And we have so many talented and smart people that join us. Um, we provide so many resources as well on the chat box there that gets shared, um, that you're going to get real time right away, um, and stay on top of what's going on. So, um, my favorite uh, phrase right now is collaboration equals confidence. Um, and that is a great place to get plugged in and, and uh, get your confidence going and collaborate with your peers, whether you're, you know, a wholesaler, a flipper, a buy and hold person, uh, lots of um, conventional lenders and hard money lenders and private lenders and anybody really um, that touches commercial real estate or multifamily. We had Bill Exeter, William Exeter from Exeter 1031 on there with us last week. That was great. Um, just real time helping people every week. So uh, again, meetup.com, look for Seattle Investors Club. It's not just about Seattle. So join us. And other than that, Joe, um, what do we want? We also want you guys to join our Facebook page um, as well as join our meetup page. Where do you want them to join, Joe? First and foremost, if I had a list of requests for y'all, it would be to uh, subscribe to our meetup page. So meetup.com slash Seattle Investors Club. And if you guys are rocking it on Facebook, then ask to join our uh, Facebook group as well. And if you want videos, join our YouTube channel. But most of all, follow Sean Katona because he's the man. (laughs) Yeah. Be always fun to be with you guys. And just, it's so awesome that you guys are sharing all your knowledge and your relationships with everyone as openly as you are. Um, it's, it's, it's helping everyone further their portfolios and their careers. So kudos and thank you. Right on, brother. And anybody who's listening, if you guys want us to have somebody that you love learning from on the podcast, you can go ahead and hit me up at julie at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Uh, we got good thing going on here and our pull of getting, you know, top notch guests um, is pretty good. And we just like to hear from everyday people. In fact, speaking of that, we want to continue on in our series of, you know, my first three deals, which is where we hear from people who are just getting started. And, and it is not only fun and oftentimes very funny uh, to hear these stories and how everybody gets beat up. It makes everybody feel like they're human. So if you've done a handful of deals or, you know, at least three deals or up to, you know, six, seven, eight, nine deals, whether that be on multifamily or fix and flip or buy and holds or commercial, whatever it is, we want to hear from you, please, because we want to share your story. We, everybody is asking us for this. Everybody wants to hear from you. You don't have to go on video if you don't want to. Mostly the time, these guys are just so gorgeous that we decided to put it up on video today. Like I said, look at me, guys. I'm here still right here. Mom zone. In the mom zone right here. That's why you're not looking at me today. But you can see me on Thursdays when you join us. Um, but we want to hear from you. Please, Juliet, SeattleInvestorsClub.com. We want to put you on our podcast. So there you go. Over and out. That's all I got for today. Anybody else? Joe, where can they find the details of today's podcast? All the show notes are over at seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 117. Link, God. show notes, all that stuff. We have done 117 of these? Dang. Boy. 
That's pretty good. Fun stuff. All right, guys. Have a wonderful day, a spring day, wherever you're at, and we'll catch you next time. Over and out. Thanks for listening to the Seattle Investors Club podcast. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered on the show, shoot us an email at info at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Now go out, take that action, and build that real estate business. Thanks for listening.